Hey, it's great to see everybody. Good morning. How are we? Hey, grab your Bible. Uh, you can turn to the book of John if you're walking with us. All of our members, all of our members are reading through the book of John right now. And so this past Tuesday, Wednesday, you were in John 11 where we find the, uh, the text for the message today. Okay. Hey, I was just reminded, just down there, reminded, just singing the songs, being reminded of the truth that really does guide us because we're prone to forget. I was just reminded of how important this, this time is. I'm preaching to kind of the proverbial choir. You're here, but listen, the, the, the weekly discipline of gathering together with God's people is so critical in our lives because we have a lot that's coming at us and this life is hard, right? And we're reminded that, yeah, you know, it's hard because uh, there's a thing called sin that has really impacted all of us. I was just reminded in our singing, just, man, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love, I, I want to love you. I think I love you. I don't know if I loved you all week. I don't know. I want to love you more. That's a good thing. And for us to encourage each other in that. Like, this is true, and this is true. And we're all going, yes, I believe this is true. The, the whole gathering, the whole corporate gathering of worship reminds us that this is not our home. That sure enough, there's this ambient grief and loss that we experience in our lives. And if you have had a tough week, I mean, some of y'all with, with kids, you've had a tough week. I mean, it's been hard, right? But it, it, it's been maybe a challenging week. Maybe you're in a really challenging season right now. Um, because the Bible teaches us, here it is, that we all have a collective grief. We all have a collective memory of Eden. It's like in our DNA. I mean, you don't have to be a religious person. To, to, you don't have to be a Christian to know this. Something's not right here. Something is broken in this world. And God reminds us of that. And that's what we're saying over and over again to each other, that we live in a broken world, but there's hope. This past week, um, I found out a, a good friend of mine, a lot of you know, uh, Paul Spain, who was a former deacon chair here not too many years ago. Paul died suddenly this past week. I talked to his wife, Graylene, and his, you know, his daughters, the whole family. I found out yesterday that my friend, longtime friend of mine, that I still am in touch with constantly, his brother committed suicide. Uh, I mean, I could go on, right? As a pastor, I enter into a lot of these experiences, but there were not too many years ago where I experienced a real season of grief. Um, it, my, my dad passed away, but there were a lot of personal losses that I experienced in my life, and and I was talking to one of our pastors on our staff because the pastor needs a pastor. And, and he said, Jeff, good grief. You're going through grief is what it is. It's grief. Like, look at what you've lost. You've just named all those things and all the things. That, and, you know, and my, those of you all know me, I'm just optimistic enough, positive enough. I'm just pressing on, right? You got to do life. You got to keep going. And he said, no, 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 no. Grief is a process. And if you don't identify grief and you're lost, you'll never, you'll never get there. And that set me on a trajectory that started over months, and I could say years, in some ways, I think even now, still dealing with loss. And yet we experience loss all the time. And what I want you to do today is to think about a particular focus. This can be really tender for some of us. Maybe it's really acute right now. What loss you're grieving in your life? Some of us are grieving loss, and we have not identified it yet. We got this ambient, like low grade sadness that we've not really dealt with. Part of it is recognizing we live in a fallen world. You're not alone. Like everybody else is happy. No, not everybody else is happy. And so I want you to identify what you're grieving. Um, maybe it's a loss of relationship. Maybe it is a loss of a loved one. Maybe it's a loss of a dream. Maybe you're thinking, I wish I, th or I thought I would have been further along by now. And this whole sanctification thing. Because here's the thing. My, my friend whose brother committed suicide, he's, he's a therapist. And he said, he said to me, he said, you know, mental health and all that, that he's walked through this brother of his for years. He said, it's not a prerequisite to sanctification, but it sure can get in the way. And, and we all need help in that. So those of y'all that are pursuing help, getting help, are we going to talk about some resources 
that we have here in our church, then, hey, I applaud you. But I want you to know today, you're not alone, friends. We are a broken people, and we need help. And so today we're going to see that grief um, confronts our faith. It, 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 like nothing else, I think, in my experience. Loss and grief, unexpected you know, uh, challenges and problems in the world will, will confront our faith, what we really believe. But it also clarifies our faith, which is a really good thing. And then finally, we're going to see that Jesus comforts us in our grief. Okay, so turn to John 11 if you're not there. I'm not going to show you all the verses because there's a lot here, but I want to set it in context. This I am statement that he makes here this, today, we're going to look at, you know the story, um, likely. But it's, it's the story of Jesus stepping into a grieving family. This is Mary and Martha who've lost their brother Lazarus. You might know that he loves this family. Like if Jesus had a home and he didn't, this would be his home. Like this, these are his people. This is his family. And it names every one of them. Every time you encounter them, names them over and over again by name. And this is what happens here. He loves each one of them and they're all very different in their personalities, it seems. And he loves each of us. And the word gets to him from the sisters. It says, hey, the one you love is ill. I love that. I don't know if it's a dig, like, hey, you love him. You know, you really love him. Remember that. Like, come on, you really care about this guy. But this is the one, how about this? John, the beloved disciple who self-identifies as the one Jesus loves, is all of us, by the way. And if we could just see one another, like, this is the one. You're the one that Jesus loves. You are the one that he loves. Hey, you're the one Jesus loves. Like, he loves me. If we could see each other that way. Really, that's the church, right? That's what unites us, is we're the ones, we're the people he loves. Like, he loves everybody, yes. But he has these close friends and relationship with this family, and he loved each one of them. And I love that. John's sharing the love. Like, he's, he's probably like, I love how he loved them like he loves me. And this is, this is so great. In verse 4, it says, um, Jesus says, hey, he's not going to die from this illness. Instead, the Son of God... Me is going to be glorified. And then strangely, when Jesus hears of Lazarus' illness, you probably know this, he chooses not to go see him. Now, check this out. In verse 5, it says, he loved them so he chose not to go. What? He loved them so much so he chose not to go. And it says, then he says to his disciples, hey, let's go to Judea. And the disciples are like, wait, you know, you know, every time you speak there now, they pick up stones in order to kill you, especially with all these I am statements you're making, by the way. Like we can get a PR guys like you. We can cut that out because this is getting dangerous. We don't want to go to Judea. And then, you know, some, some conversations there and then some time, right? There's a couple of days go by. There's a messenger goes back to Mary and Martha and without Jesus. And they're like, what's up? They didn't have texting back then, right? And so then in verse 11, he says, okay, Lazarus has fallen asleep. It's time for me to go wake him up. And then the disciples are like, oh, if he's fallen asleep. He's going to be fine. Like, we don't need to go now. And Jesus then, he says in verse 14, um, okay, no, he's dead, all right? Let's be clear, he is dead. In fact, it's referenced over and over again in this passage. You'll see he's dead. He is dead. And then, then here's, here's what I want you to see, first of all. Whatever grief you've identified or whatever loss you're walking through, and we all are in some way, you need to know this. God is at work in ways that you cannot see. Mary and Martha don't know any of this that I've shared thus far. They know nothing. They have been grieving with family and friends, we're going to see, who've come from Jerusalem. I guess it's a 35, 40-minute walk. And they're like, Where'd Jesus could come any minute. And he doesn't. For days he doesn't come. And so the first thing I want you to see, though, is this. Our grief confronts our faith. In my experience, again, not like nothing else, grief challenges our faith. So could it be, if you want to grow in your faith, I know we're not, we don't want to say, Lord, bring it on, bring on the trouble, bring on the trouble. But as you go through grief and loss enough, you start to see, I can trust him in this. Like he really is at work in this. And we're going to see this play out here. Look at verse 17. Here we go. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Okay, after threats on his life, he comes now, he's waited three days. Now it's the fourth day. Now here's what's interesting. There was a belief, many uh, commentators, historians, I think that it was described even here in this context, 
where even Jews believed that for three days, you're, the soul of the person hovered over the body. Okay, no, that's not, that's not biblical. But think about that. If that's the case, Jesus like, okay, not three days, four days. Like, what's going on? Uh, he's dead. I mean, this, again, keeps coming up. He is dead. There's no other way to explain what is about to happen. Spoiler alert. You know where this is going. Verse 18. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Again, really not far at all. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went, don't miss this, went out to meet him. He's not yet at the village there at Bethany. Goes out to meet him. But Mary remained seated um, in the house. So she's around with all the others. Now some, if you, know the, you know the Luke 10 story where Martha's busy running around. A lot of commentators think that she's probably the older sister because she seems to be running the house. Uh, it's kind of tight casting, but she's type A, kind of older sister, it seems, and Mary. But I think it's just different personalities. Mary's more contemplative. Uh, she's with friends, grieving. Martha's like, let's do something. Let's do, get something done, right? A lot of, and that's how we, we kick in to, to seek to, to try to just get busy during times of grief. Look at verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Now look at this. Martha's faith is being confronted or the grief that she's experiencing is confronting her faith. Now, I think what's going to happen, and listen, this will help some of us here. You, you've, you know that modern psychiatrists tell us there's five stages essentially of grief. And it seems that could it be that first of all, she's just a few days out here. They've been grieving already talking about Lazarus, talking about he's dead and what's life going to be like and probably talking theologically like as we're going to discover. I think someday we're going to see him again. You know, we're going to, who knows, what kind of hope do we have here? But what she's experiencing here, I think is certainly shock and denial. I mean, she's still like in it. And the second phase of, of grief is anger. There might be an edge of that a little bit, but I think maybe not as we'll see here in a moment, what I'm thinking is going on here. There's denial, like this can't be happening. Maybe you're still in that phase. Anger. Why did this happen? And who's to blame? And, and sometimes we read it that way. Like, if you had been here, and that's what a lot we do, right? God, if you really cared, like if you, you're really all power. I talked to our students about this this week. Uh, when, when challenges come, you're either not all loving or you're not all powerful or this would not have happened. Mary and Martha were probably wrestling with some of this. The third phase, our stage of grief is, is bargaining right? Like, I'm going to make this not happen. What can I do? How can I change this? And then it kicks into depression, often, which is, I can't bear this. The reality hits, I can't live in this new normal. And then ultimately, with help and guidance through it all and truth that guides us, we have acceptance. I'm going to, I got to acknowledge this is not going to change. I have to acknowledge that I'm going to live with this for the rest of my life. And certain losses can impact you for the rest of your life. And so we constantly are processing. And grief has this ambushing quality about it where it just hits you over and over again. And you have to realize and recognize that grief is a process, but loss like this can forever change your life. We are all Martha because we all have a Lazarus in our life. And again, I want you to be thinking, what is it for you? And perhaps you have that kind of edge of, Lord, if you've been here, like if I, I mean, grief will rock your faith and make you question everything that you believe. So grief confronts our faith, but watch this. Here's what happens. It challenges our faith, but, it, but grief clarifies our faith. Grief offers an opportunity for us to clarify our faith. So look at this in verse 23. It says this, Jesus um, says to her, your brother's going to rise again, right? Verse 23. And then Martha says, oh, I know he's going to rise on the day of the last resurrection. She has her, her theology right, by the way, which is incredible because Jewish eschatology is not, or even afterlife is not that clear, but this aligns with what we learn even in the New Testament um, and throughout the teachings of Jesus. So, but I love Martha. She takes a bad rap, like she's always busy, you know, doing the thing. She's not just sitting at the feet of Jesus. But again, different personalities. She is so honest and so courageous. And I think this statement that she makes in verse 21 and 22 really is a two-part thing. One, 
I don't think it's a rebuke of Jesus. Not really. You know, like, if you had been here, that's what we do. We're prone to do that. This woman is so filled with faith. That's actually a statement of her faith. Think about it. If you had been here, he would still be alive. And even now you could do something. I mean, his miracles are trending up and to the right. They watched him feed the 5,000. They watched him heal the, the man born blind. And now they're going, he, he, might could, he might could do anything. Like he might could raise Lazarus. I mean, we know he loved him. And we often have that going on too, right? Like you love, so you certainly you're going to do this. As we've, we can read God's mind always. But secondly, what's happening here, it's a lament. Because grief always is an expression of lament. And she, and she says, if you'd been here, he'd still be alive. And they're about to have a funeral waiting. You know, maybe Jesus is coming, but what's going to happen? But we run to that too, don't we? I mean, more than Martha, we run to, if only the doctors had really figured this out. If only we'd gotten there five minutes earlier. Or how about this? If only I said this or said that. If only I'd intervened. If only, we want to blame someone, don't we? But as we're going to see, the blame game doesn't help. It doesn't help. There's another way. But Martha's full of faith. And her comment in, in verse 22 is clear evidence of that. She not only believes, watch this, she still believes. And this, that's, this is amazing. We're watching her faith being clarified right before our eyes. You could say that, that Jesus is spinning a cocoon around this caterpillar of Martha's faith and a beautiful butterfly is about to emerge. Even greater faith is what's going to happen here. But that's not always what happens, is it? We've all walked through times of loss and grief and our faith has not turned out that way. And you know people that are like that, likely not here today maybe, or maybe you are and you're wrestling with like, no, this thing that I've lost has rocked my world and it has impacted the way that I think about God and it has not helped my faith. Stay in the game. C.S. Lewis in his book, A Grief Observed, where he identifies or, 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 or thinks through um, some of the things that he learned while he watched his wife die. It's a collection of thoughts. She died of cancer. But he talks about the danger that grief poses to our faith. He says this, not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion is, uh, to dread is not, oh, so there is no God. But, so this is what God is really like. Deceive yourself no longer, he says. What he's saying is it's possible to go through loss and grief and start to believe things about God that are not true. What do you do with that? Continue to come back to the truth of what you already know about him. Continue to have people speak into your life. It's why when, when people go through grief, you can't dismiss yourself from the body of Christ. You can't stop coming. Keep on coming. Keep fighting the good fight. Be like Martha. Go to him. Go to Jesus. Keep running to him. Jesus is rather abrupt here. It's, it's almost like she's saying, he's saying, hey, Lazarus is going to be fine. Someday. And we go there too, right? Like, I really believe this about God. I believe that, you know, Jesus came, eternal life. But here I am with my problems right here, right now. But watch this. He's going to step into right here, right now. And Jesus is showing Martha that her current beliefs are not adequate to walk her through the faith that she has. He's taking her to deeper faith. And he does that with us. And friends, listen, don't miss this. He's doing this for you right now. As you walk through grief yourself, he is taking you to deeper faith. But here's the thing. Don't miss this. You can have your theology right and still have a million questions. It's okay. We're going to see this here. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to weep. We live in a broken world. Things are broken. It's okay to weep. But it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to rage against God. He's big enough for that. And so we, we need to do those things, though. You're, you're going to still have questions, and some of them will go unanswered, which then requires real faith, right? So look, then he makes this most audacious claim. Here it is in verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am 
the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And I've got a sense that, that Jesus pauses there. He's finished what he wants to say. But then he says, I think he looked her in the eyes. And his, his words echo into this room today, into your soul. And he looks at her and he says, do you, do you believe this? Because, friends, listen, the answer to that question changes everything. It changes everything. When you're standing over the grave of a, of a loved one who's died, it changes everything. When, you, when you're in a memorial service or you're at a funeral or, you, or some loss that you've had, this changes everything. This statement places Jesus in either in an insane asylum or it places him on the throne of the universe. Again, he's either a liar, then proven to be a liar, or he's a lunatic, he's crazy, or he's Lord. There's no other option. He is saying, I am God. Only God would say this. And they're believing that is he like, could he really bring this guy back to life? But you can believe again, you can believe and still struggle. Mary and Martha have been waiting on Jesus to show up. The story's not going like they thought it would. And yet they've had friends around them. Don't miss that. That's a powerful detail. They've got people of faith around them. They've been talking, again, about Lazarus, his life, and about death. Sadly, most families don't talk about death until someone has died. And we, we, should, we should be different. I'm not saying we're, you know, it's just talking about death all the time. But we, our culture will follow culture, which is to deny death. Like you're young forever, right? And you're never going to die. And if people die, shh, put them aside. Like put them aside. Hey, um, aunt, so-and-so, dad's dying, so let's put him, just hide him out over here and let him die and disappear. We're all going to die. And, and, and this is a good day to remember uh, you're dying someday. We're shocked when people die, right? No, we all die. And Jesus steps into that life's ultimate battle. And he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. And friends, I'm telling you, when I'm in an ICU room watching someone die, when I am doing a funeral, when I'm standing over a graveside with a weeping family, the answer to that question changes everything. People say, how do lost people make it through times like that? They don't. They don't. They might stay alive the next day and just keep pressing on. They don't make it through. They don't have faith clarified often. Sometimes they do. And, and then walking with greater faith. Because here's what happens. Grief will reveal your faith. Here's what C.S. Lewis says again in a grief observed. He says, it'll reveal your faith as real or the house of cards that it is. And the only way that God can reveal to you that your faith is a house of cards is to tear it down. And that's what grief does for us. It, it, unless it's real faith and we say, Lord, I do believe and I'm going to press into this. I'm going to believe even more. I believe that you are who you are and I'm going to hold on. I mean, I'm going to just cling to you because, you know, here's the thing. Faith is not so much born out of crisis. It's revealed in crisis, which is why we believe him today. And Martha believes. Look at verse 27. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world. These words are as powerful. You've heard those before, right? Remember Peter in, in Matthew 16, 16? Who do you say I am? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Martha's, that's as powerful as Peter's confession. Like, why didn't she get as much pub here, right? Like, that's big time. This was a woman of faith, and, and grief confronts our faith. It clarifies our faith, but let's close with this. Jesus comforts us in our faith. Martha goes and calls her sister. Mary comes, and the group of grieving friends come along as well. And then in verse 32, now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Exactly what Martha said. I mean, almost to a word. She says the same thing, but then Jesus responds to her differently. Why? They're two different people, but I think there's something deeper going on here. 
See, with, with Martha, he says, your brother will rise again. And then he says, I am the resurrection and life. But watch what happens here. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. We'll talk about that in a moment. And he said, where have you laid him? Like, he, let's go. They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then the shortest verse in all the Bible, Jesus wept. One of the most profound verses in the Bible. What's going on here? With Martha, he is God. I am the resurrection and the life. But it's not just like I'm God. Now with Mary, we see what kind of God he is. He's the God man is who he is. He steps into our world and he steps into our grief and he weeps. And think about this. Again, spoiler alert, he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead in about 10 minutes. And he's grieving. Why? Because he's perfect. That's why. He's the most mature person who's ever lived. And he is weeping over sin and death and the collateral damage that it all does in our lives. Why is he weeping? He's weeping because of love. That's why. See, this is why we say, friends, listen, regardless of whether you sense God or see him at work in your life right now or through your grief or through loss or whatever mess you're going through or why can't I get over this thing or how come I continue to struggle with this in my life, whether it's, you know, depression or anxiety or some particular habitual sin that we, you know, need to overcome or whatever, whatever your thing is, it brings maybe constant grief in your life, whatever it is. You cannot say, whatever you can say about all your suffering, you can't say that God has turned his back on you and he doesn't care about you. You can't say that because he has stepped into our grief. He has stepped into, he was a man of sorrows. Only Christianity dares to say this, that we have a God who is acquainted with grief. He's a man of sorrows who has stepped into our world, our broken world. So he's God. And then now we see he is the God man. He weeps with us. We often say this, grief is the price we pay for love. And none of us can imagine the grief of perfect love. None of us can imagine the grief that Jesus is experiencing here. But he's weeping because of his love for us. And look at this in verse 36. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. And yes, there was that. But some of them said, well, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying somehow? Like there's, there's this growing faith. Again, his, his, his miracles are up and to the right. I mean, they're trending up and they're like, he, he could have done something here. And then verse 38, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Now, this is important. This little phrase, deeply moved again, is in the Greek, the word means to quake with anger. Literally, it means like, a snor like an animal snorting, like nostrils flaring. It's, to, it's to, just to be so angry. Have you ever seen a child that's just so angry they start crying? You seen that? I think that's what is going on here. In fact, Tim Keller says that, to, that our, our translators have softened this so much that it's lexically irresponsible to say that it's something other than this. Like, yeah, he was kind of up to that a little bit. He is outraged. Why is that? What is going on? What's he mad about? Sin. Death. That's what it is. And so Jesus says, look at verse 39. Jesus said, take away the stone, Martha. The sister of the dead man, there it is again. Remember, he's dead, like he's really dead. It's been four days. The sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, by this time, there will be an odor. Like He's for real dead, for he has been, been dead for four days. Okay, he's clarifying all this. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you will see the glory of God? What? John Calvin, uh, he writes this. He, he said, Christ did not come to the sepulcher as an idle spectator, but like the wrestler preparing for a contest. He groans, 
For the violent tyranny of death, which he had to overcome, stands before his eyes. This becomes a forecasting of Christ's resurrection. Jesus now is standing there. Watch this. The incarnate one, who, who is the pre-existent one, the perfect holy one, in whom there is no sin, enters into our world, our brokenness, that includes death, Zoe life in the person of Jesus come and enter into this moment, literally life and death right before him. And then it says in verse 41, so they, they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, father, I thank you that you heard me. And then look at this little, little bit. I know that you always hear me, but I'm saying all this on account of everybody standing around me here. So they'll believe too. Right? Like, I can do this silently, but Father, I'm talking to you. And then in verse 43, when he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice. And some have noted too, is he crying out in anger? Like, I'm done with this. I'm done with death. And he says, he says, Lazarus, come out. Some commentators have noted, he says Lazarus' name or every dead, buried person would have come out right then. Like, Lazarus, I'm talking to you. (laughs) Lazarus, come out of here. And the man who had died, (laughs) there he is, came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. He's a mummy, right? He's a mummy. And and Jesus said to him, said to them, unbind him, let him go. Their suspicions were right. And ours are too. Jesus can do anything. He can turn whatever you're walking through. He redeems all that he allows. Friends, don't miss this. Whatever you're walking through, whatever loss you've identified, whatever challenge you face, what we want to do is blame everybody else. If I wasn't just men, or even blame God, if I wasn't born this way, I wouldn't have this propensity towards this thing. If if if, if, If that person hadn't jacked my life up, if that person hadn't messed up my marriage, if this kid would get his act together, if if my job, if those people, and y'all, that didn't help. We need to stop that. What does help is the gospel story. The gospel story in every situation is this. He overcomes death in whatever form it is with life. He is at work right now in your life in ways you cannot see. And we've just got to trust him. But here's what happens. How and why can we trust him? Verse 53, it says, From that day on, they made plans to kill him. What? Jesus is now the most dangerous man on the planet. And they're making plans to kill him. Don't miss this. Lazarus will die again. He will die after the resurrection of Jesus, after Christ goes to the cross, after the resurrection, Mary and Martha will grieve again. But the next time with great hope. Now we see divinity wrapped up in vulnerability. Jesus interrupts, look at this, Lazarus' funeral, knowing that it will trigger his own. Because that's where he's heading. And that's what we now know on this side of it all. He's angrier about whatever injustice you're facing in your life right now, more than you are. He's angrier about the thing that has taken place that has messed you up. And he steps into that space and he comes and he goes to the cross. And then one final time, watch this. Heaven and earth meet. Zoe life, the life giver and death are confronted at the cross God's holiness and his inflexible love for you and for me collide and salvation is made possible for you, if you will believe. Martha's question that Jesus asked her comes to you today. Do you believe this? And only you can settle that. Let's pray together. Let's do this. Let's close our eyes. We're going to have a time. We're going to enter into the Lord's Supper together before we go. And now we're going to give our hearts to him. Friend, if you don't know him, you can just say, yes, I believe. I believe you took my sin upon the cross, that you died for me, 
Your body was broken. Your blood was shed for me so that I wouldn't have to die. And you bring life even here and now. And someday when I face death myself, and it's coming, I can know that I know that you are the resurrection and the life and you've made a way where we believe. But we pause to remember and do what you've told us to do, to celebrate what you have accomplished. And so now we worship you as we partake of the elements and remember. In Jesus' name, let's continue to worship him.